thank you so much, Pop, for coming on the podcast and talking with me for a little bit. I just want to start out um, with the question that every magician has heard hundreds, if not thousands of times. But how did you get started in magic? Well, um, I started uh, when I was about eight or nine, um, like everybody else, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Got a magic set, and um, that's how it got started. Cool. <laughs> and um, you, you. But of course, also on TV at that time was uh, the Magic Land of Alakazam with Mark Wilson, and that was a, a huge influence on me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and uh, so that was that was a big part of it. Right. And how did you take magic from being just like a hobby to your career? Well, um, I. <clears throat> um, dropped out of college uh, to fight the, the draft and applied for conscientious objector status. Mm-hmm. And then I went to New York and started working on uh, alternative service uh, at New York uh, Uni- University Hospital. But then uh, when they called me for a physical, I flunked that and because of my eyesight. And so I got fired from my job. Oh. And I was living in New York without a job. Um, so I went out on the streets and started doing card tricks for uh, money. And uh, I actually made a lot more money than, than I would have thought. <laughs> how, how did you decide, like, which which effects, which tricks to do on the street, though? Well, uh, they're pretty... Uh, I, I don't even remember what card tricks I did back at that time, but, um, you know, they... There had to be stuff that moved fast and grab people. I was doing it not like um, most uh, street magicians. I, I would gather a small crowd in front of a on a sidewalk in front of a, a store window, mm-hmm. and uh, I would do small magic for like ten, twenty people, and uh, then if the cops came, I could put the cards away and turn around, and I was just one of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Did you ever have any like bad or or good encounters with the cops? Oh yeah, I talk about some of them in in my book uh, on street magic. The uh, <clears throat> um, one time I was uh, I was working the same spot all the time uh, near Sixth uh, uh, Avenue, um, and uh, um, Eighth Street, I think. And uh, there was a jewelry store there, and the, it had windows, you know, on either side going in. And when it was closed at night, I could stand in there like a little stage, and it blocked off my angles. And I did things like the rope and the rings and uh, billiard balls and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one time, I, I had a little uh, Puerto Rican kid named Angel that would uh, be in the crowd and kind of keep on the lookout for the police. Um, and uh, if he saw me say something, I'd turn around and... They come up to the window. There, there'd be nobody doing anything. There's just this crowd staring in the jewelry <laughs> store window. And that went off for a couple of weeks. Till one time, Angel didn't. Uh, he went off to get an orange Julius without telling me. And I look up to have somebody pick a card, and there's a cop standing there. Oh wow! And he he you know, walked me off down the street um, to a coffee shop and t- took me inside. There's another cop in there, and he said, "I caught that guy." And, and the guy says, what guy? He says, the, you know, the guy that was uh, drawing a crowd down over on 8th Street. He says, really? What was he doing? He says, card tricks. Show him a trick, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I did card tricks for the two of them, and they, they gave me money. They tipped me, and they, they told me not to come back in their <laughs> precinct again. But that there was a, another precinct just a, a, a ways away that I could go to. A certain, they gave me a spot that was just like the one I had. They said, you'll make money there. And, when uh, when they bust you, just tell them that uh, Frank and Charlie from the uh, sixty six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing! <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That um, was in nineteen sixty nine. And now you perform all over. You perform at the Magic Castle. You were vice president of the, of the Magic Castle for four years, and you've won all kinds of awards there. How did you kind of go from street to stage? Well, I started out, I uh, joined a theater company um, um, in in Tennessee. Um, They were a populist political theater. 
uh, touring uh, group, and I was doing uh, juggling and fire eating and magic to kind of open their shows and draw a crowd. Um, and uh, I was with them for a couple of years, and I got an invitation to work at a, a Tombstone Junction, which is a, a just doing magic. It was a, a gunfighter uh, uh, train uh, park, theme park, gunfight theme park. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was there for uh, a couple of years, uh, working just in the summers for five months, but they paid really well. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I met my wife there, and, and we moved back out to we moved out to California, and uh, to be near the Magic Castle, and. Um, that's when I started doing, you know, uh, restaurants, close-up magic, and nightclubs, comedy clubs, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that that was kind of your transition right there. Yeah, that would be a fairly much transition to yep. professional magic was from going, taking a job with the uh, theme park. Cool. And the theme park was Tombstone Junction. Tombstone Junction. That's where uh, Matt King and Lance Burton worked too they, yes i was really i was been lucky <laughs> yeah, i was their uh first uh magician and oh, they were wow. just trying to decide between doing a canned magic act uh like uh, mark wilson put out with a mm -hmm. college kid in a costume like a rabbit or something and right. music and pushing illusions around on stage uh and and having a live performer and he hadn't decided a real magician so i came and uh did some magic for him and they tried it out they loved it and um, after I left, um, they hired um, a couple of other magicians, um, uh, and uh, then uh, after them, it was Lance and, and Mac. And uh, Lance and Mac had got the Lance was doing that wonderful Dove Act, five shows a day, <laughs> <laughs> seven days a week for five months. Wow. And they they've been really lucky to get some some talented magicians there. <laughs> Oh yes, yeah. They, they, they thought good magicians were a dime a dozen there in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I bet. laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and would you say that I mean, just doing five shows a day for five months that you you had already worked the streets? Would you say just doing as much magic as much as possible. Yeah, but performing it well, it's it's all flight time. Right. You know, the the more hours you have in front of a crowd, the easier it is, you know, and the better it gets. Mm -hmm. And you have a wonderful character. I I love watching you do magic, and your character that you present is so amazing. How how do you come to that character? Do you have a whole backstory that you never tell anybody about that only you know, or what what's the well, uh, oh yeah, the character does have a backstory. Um, and the idea, uh, this is not something I would recommend. <laughs> to most people. <laughs> this was this is an obsessive compulsive person carrying things to an extreme. Um, but I wanted to uh, create a, a magic character that was a fantasy character, um, mm. uh, something that struck at that nine-year-old. Um, Heart like Indiana Jones, where a grown-up and a, a kid can both enjoy it on different levels. I think this was the, the sweet spot of the magicians of the 1920s, where they had background characters, Chung Ling Su from the mysterious caves of the Orient, and uh, you know um, the uh, Clyde Beatty type uh, Carter with his fifth helmet and all the wild animals he collected in Africa, and uh, there was Blackstone the uh, magician detective who had his own radio show and his own comic book. You know, so when the kids went to see those guys, they were going to see, you know, um, uh, like Indiana Jones, <laughs> seeing a fantasy <laughs> character on stage. You know, and that background story wasn't presented really necessarily at all on stage, but, you know, the kids knew about it. Well, that kind of stuff had to be created back then in very expensive ways with radio and, and, and comic books and lithograph posters and all that kind of stuff. Well, today we have the Internet, mm -hmm. so we can do all our um, uh, backstory on the Internet, you know. Because really, if, you, know, uh, you know, if people find you on the Internet and get hooked into the story, then they want to see you live. Mm 
Right. And if they see you live, they might look you up and find all this backstory that they didn't know about. It makes them more interested. Mm-hmm. Um, so I create on the back story as much as possible to, to support the act and, and my character's backstory and stuff. And it does influence the way you present because I wanted the, the character to be completely here in the 21st century. I didn't want my audiences to have to imagine themselves back in time um, like you would with uh, one of the the great shows Max Howard did with uh, the uh, Gus Hall, the Southern magician from the 1850s. He would put on the makeup in front of the audience and become Gus Hall. And then the audience would pretend that they were in the 1860s looking at a magic show, you know. Uh, and then the spell was broken. I thought that was wonderful. It was a beautiful piece. But um, it kind of gives you that reenactment problem. You know, uh, you can't really relate to the audience in, a, in the kind of way that a comedian needs to if you don't know what's going on, if you don't know about drugs, if you don't know about the president. You know, like in a reenactment, like uh, you're in uh, Salem Village, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, Jones, Jamestown. Um, you ask somebody who the president is, they'll tell you, you know, president, what president? <laughs> 1600s. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> the king, we have a king. You know, <laughs> they can't break character. Well, mm-hmm. that can be very frustrating, you know, when you're trying to communicate uh, as a performer. So I want the character to be brought here into the 21st century so he's completely here and been here long enough to know what's going on. Um, so the, uh, the story was this is a, a medicine show um, performer who had been a con man in the gold rush in the 1890s and um, in 1910 he got blown into the 21st century by accident not entirely his fault um, with his whole medicine company and uh, uh, a whole little town of uh, <laughs> 1910 westerners who were brought into the 21st century with him mm-hmm. yeah that's really cool and do you how how long did it take for you to like think of that character? Did it just kind of pop into your head, or has it has it was it a work in well, progress for a while? What I wanted, well, for several things went off at once. This all started in two thousand and five. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> until then, I didn't have a southern accent when I was performing. I didn't have a uh, that kind of a character. It was a more of a, a, a substitute uh, teacher in a, with an unruly class. Kind of straight white, you know, three-piece suit. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I worked mostly corporate events and trade shows and cruise ships and that kind of stuff. Well, in 2005, um, I got hired to do a shell game. I'd been studying the shell game and the, the masters of the 19th century shell game uh, with the School for Scoundrels, which, I, of course, I taught with Chef Anton at the Magic Castle mm-hmm. for over 20 years. And... Um, so I had this background in understanding that, and somebody asked me to do a, a cowboy festival up in uh, uh, Santa Clarita. And so I put together a costume and a, put on a fake mustache, and uh, I, just, I just do the shell game to all comers, just like it was working on the street. You know, it would be fun to get my practice up. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, <clears throat> I found out I couldn't do a Western accent to save my life. I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I tried doing my uh, an imitation of my southern uh, grandfather from Virginia, um, and he had a very old-fashioned Virginia accent, very thick from the western part of the state. And as soon as I started using that, with a, it was a deeper voice, and uh, it cut through the chatter real quick. People were walking across the street to come see who this was, making all this noise. <laughs> so I decided this is pretty powerful. I, you know, might should consider doing this mm-hmm. so uh, after that did you was it kind of immediate that you started doing this or was it no, well pretty much immediate i started doing the character but i was mm-hmm. mainly planning to do it just you know to put on the character and then um you know quit and be myself again right. you know just just do it for for performance um and that was fine for a little while but for stage especially it worked really good but then when i started doing close up um in that character, um, it became clear that people didn't like to see the character broken. Mm. And it's like taking the head off Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> they don't believe I'm really from 1910, but they do think I really am a, this crazy old Southern man. Mm-hmm. 
You know, they don't want that illusion broken. Right. So I ended up feeling like I had to stay in character 24-7, like Chung Ling Su. Mm -hmm. Except that he gets to take a break when he's not in costume. <laughs> Nobody knew, knew who he was. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Pop is pretty um, spotable. Mm -hmm. So I ended up take, taking on way more than I had intended to, but it's been a huge, fun thing. Uh, my idea was really that I wanted people to uh, meet a comic book character, a, a fantastic character like Pop, you know, um, like Doctor Who, um, who um, was a, a unique one of a kind experience, and to be able to engage him and to play with him, um, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, it, like, it, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be fun if you could talk to a Shakespearean character, um, you know, for twenty minutes or have a beer with Falstaff? You know, <laughs> that would be, that's kind of what I thought would be the fun of this. So here you have a full-blown character from a Wild West movie that's like here and now in front of you, <laughs> and he's picking on you and fighting with you. you you're handling yourself pretty well. Mm -hmm. You feel like that was fun. Well, that's kind of the situation I wanted to uh, create, where the magic really is just part of the proof that, that the guy was who he said he was. Mm -hmm. The more things you look at pop, the deeper you look at it, the more intricate it becomes and the more believable it becomes. He's got um, tattoos that are from the 1870s. You know, he's uh, <laughs> he uh, has the authentic uh, voice and presentations and stuff. He's a very believable uh, character. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want is to make people um, believe in the character and, and feel like they had an experience with him and think it's, it's all, of course, it's just an actor playing the part. But then, on the other hand, um, how did that coin get in the bottle? <laughs> right. If he, if, how, did that, how did that sonic screwdriver actually do those things? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, how, could the TARDIS, how could the TARDIS actually be bigger on the inside than it is on the outside? Maybe this guy is who he said he was. <laughs> Maybe he's not lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's to me. It's what entangles the mm -hmm. fantasy with the experience, the, the real experience of the person, mm -hmm. and that's what I want to do: is is entangle the uh, experience of the impossible with my own uh, fantasy instead of letting them make up their fantasies. You know, mm -hmm. so I I create a fantasy story which they walk in on, and uh, you know they 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 go out of it with a feeling that they've seen something remarkable. Mm -hmm. yeah. At this point, are you still excited to do it, or, or is it getting a little bit uh, tiresome? And is it more pop or you at this point? Well, I think pop pretty much taken over. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's not a bird. It's like playing Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I enjoy playing pop so much and and uh, engaging with the audiences, and it's very powerful. It's things that I couldn't do before in the other character I can do with Pop. Um, I found very quickly after, you know, I grew up in the South, and uh, when I was in high school, I used to spend time at the uh, stables where they, raised, where they had the uh, harness racing uh, horses, you know. And so uh, and, uh, these, these were little ponies, and they had a stable right downtown, right not far from my school, so... I used to go there and uh, hang out, and I would clean the tack and, um, you know, sweep the floors and stuff uh, just so I could hang out and listen to these old men tell stories. And there was a bunch of old men, four or five guys, black and white, who would sit around uh, a little stove and uh, spit into cups and tell these stories. And they were big-eyed storytellers when they start telling, oh, no, that ain't nothing. <laughs> I had to get real big. I'll tell you what it really happened, you know. And... Uh, as soon as I started doing pop, um, those kind of expressions and stuff started bubbling up out of the character. It's kind of like, you know, absorbed uh, those old men that I knew into the character. And it's made it a very um, believable um, and interesting character. And it's a lot of fun to do. I, uh, I, I played, uh, I, I play, I had, it's hard to go in and out of the accent, so I pretty much am stuck with the accent 24 <laughs> 7. My wife, I didn't have a southern accent when I married my, my wife <laughs> so she's had to adjust to that mm -hmm. but I grew up with a southern accent you know I, I grew up in Tennessee and North Carolina and 
Uh, so it's like a warm bath to me mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, to be able to talk any which way. <laughs> That's awesome. And and um, do you have any advice for somebody who wants to portray a character? Not necessarily a character like yours, but just any character. Well, I think everybody is always, they're always playing a character. Right. Um, well, you know, <laughs> As soon as you pretend to do magic, whether if you, whether you pretend to uh, just do sleight of hand, you know, um, which I think lacks charm. Um, basically, when you're showing off sleight of hand, you say, "Look how how clever I am! I can fool you." <laughs> you know, it's just sleight of hand. It's not really magic. You know, I'm just smarter than you, and I can beat you. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's not a very win-win situation. Mm-hmm. You know. Whereas for me, um, you want to engage people and um, fool them, but the fooling, it has to be fun for them. And it's a lot better if instead of you telling them that I'm smarter than you, if you tell them, oh, I have this special power. (laughs) (laughs) Don't feel bad. Nobody else can do this. I just have this mental power or whatever. You know, I think that's a lot more charming that you're not showing off, but maybe even... Um, not very proud of you know those abilities that come too easily. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and with your shell game, you Vernon Vernon always said, you know, you don't even tell him that you should, you don't should not tell him you practice. He says that makes everything <laughs> seem so mundane and mm-hmm. boring. You know, tell him it's just a knack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. See, but that I mean, because that's a lot more interesting, a lot more fun. Yeah. You know. Then tell them, oh, yeah, you could do this if you spent, you know, 10 hours a day for 10 years working on it, you know. Well, that sounds awfully dreary. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think magic should be geared toward the 12-year-old uh, kid, you know. Uh, if you, uh, like, Pop is really kind of a Professor Marvel uh, from Wizard of Oz, you know. He um, got blown into the 21st century by accident and has to find his way around and find a way to make a living and survive and stuff. Uh, and he's a medicine show pitch man. And these people will pay $4 for a bottle of water. Mm-hmm. So, you see, he's ready to run for president. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, um, taking over the munchkins, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, he's doing a, uh, magic shows to make a living. And... Uh, you know, this lady, he, he joined the Magic Castle, and, you know, he's been here since 2005, and he knows everything that's going on. He's all over the Internet, and, uh, you know, he's trying to get money together so he can get his whole medicine show back together. And mm-hmm. this lady uh, hired me to do magic for her guests at this party. You're one of her guests. Take a fucking card. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <laughs> that's the way I enter. So I think most magicians, what they forget is that the story of magic that they're telling, all the audience will get is from the moment they meet the magician to the moment he leaves. Mm-hmm. And you don't have time. If you were really from the 19th century, you wouldn't tell people that. <laughs> They'd arrest you. <laughs> They'd think you were crazy. Plus, you don't have any... You don't have any documentation. Why are you here? How, who are you? Mm-hmm. you know, I have a, a birth certificate from 1849. What good is that going to do? <laughs> you know, you're an illegal alien in your own country. <laughs> yeah. And so you have to be very careful about not breaking the laws and not calling attention from the authorities. So you wouldn't say anything about who you were, where you're from. You just do your show. You know, try and make some money. Too. So that's that's where the thing is. So the backstory is is not hidden, but it's it's nothing I would discuss at the show. The show mm-hmm. is only this moment you get to see it. It's like the magic show is like if you were to see just the um, play, uh, The Murder of Gonzago, and it was right out of the Hamlet, mm-hmm. but all you got to see was the, the play that Hamlet produced in order to get the conscience of the king. Mm-hmm. Where the actors on that stage, when they're playing this murder of Gonzago, they will be pretending that there's a important person at the back of the house, and they'll go below into it just like they would in the thing. And you get this feeling there's a lot more going on here than than it seems on the surface. Right. You may not know what it is. You may not know that whole backstory about Hamlet, but you can feel that it was there. You know. Well, the magic show is is the point at which the magical character is here now doing magic for this group. 
and you have to bring the character up to the moment he walks on stage. Who was he before? What, did he have a past? Was he do, what was he doing before he came here? And why is he here? What is he trying to show us? What is he trying to do? All that kind of stuff is what the character has to figure out before he greets the audience. And you mentioned that you, you don't tell the audience everything, but you do interact a lot with the audience. Um, oh, yes. Even, even people who don't like come up to participate in a trick, you'll ask them questions and just hold eye contact with them, which I love. <laughs> right. How, how do you select the volunteers? Like, do you, do you come out there and you think this person will make a good volunteer and you'll use them later, or is it kind of just in the moment? It's just in the moment. I, you know, basically, I, I, I like to work. It doesn't matter who I work with, really. Mm -hmm. There's some people that are extraordinarily good, but I try and make everybody look good. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and I want them to feel more than anything else that, 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 that Pop thinks they're clever. Pop thinks they're fun to play with. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the play face, I think, is very important in Pop because of his fluidity and his facial um, antics and his eye movements and stuff. He's he's perfect for a play face, which is like a, a dog wants another dog to play with him. He gets down low and he makes a stupid look. Face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll play, we'll play. <laughs> Let's play, you know. Yeah. Well, Bob kind of does that to his audience, you know. It's like, you know, when you put on a really weird kind of face and you stare somebody straight in the eye, kind of like force him to interact with his weirdo in this character. It's like the magician is the lead improv actor and the audience mm -hmm. are the other improv actors. And you're, you're kind of orchestrating them and leading them into how to perform, how to play with you. And then it's like as much emotion as you can. I'm, I'm always, you know, uh, sometimes people say there should be emotion and magic, but then they mean I'll tell them a story about somebody once in history who had an emotion. <laughs> 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 and I go, well, no, what I mean you know, by emotion is a magician's emotion. The magician is interesting when he's going through things, when he's in trouble, treading water, um, triumphant, um, uh, cagey. Um, all the things he he experienced with the audience, the audience sees that. That's that's the play. That's what's happening. You know, uh, can you count like up to ten? <laughs> 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 Suddenly the kid go, well, yeah, yeah, I can to ten. Are you kidding? <laughs> okay, good because I work a lot of uh, saloons and stuff where people have a hard time. With, Let's count. I want you to count eight, you know. And so you get into a fight with, you know, no, that was seven. <laughs> you know, <laughs> more you can, if the lady squares, put, say, lift up a half the deck, I'll put a card here, put your top, put the second half back on top of it, um, and then they square it up. I go, I didn't say square them up. <laughs> You're about the meanest woman I think I have ever met. <laughs> See, but that, that constant pushing back and forth and playing with people and screwing with them. I think mm -hmm. it's basically the, uh, the magician is a celebration of the trickster, of the, guy, of the man or woman who lives by his wits instead of by brawn. And that's why it's so related to all the con men and charlatans and tricksters, uh, because that's the heart of him. The only thing is the magician is a, an innocent trickster. He's a version of the trickster character that's... Um, just play it. It's not trying to take your wallet or get your allegiance. <laughs> he's just he's just fucking with you, you know? <laughs> like a grandfather playing with the kids. Mm -hmm. And Pop is very much a grandfather figure. I think that was very liberating to me um, when I first started doing it. Was that he's obviously um, an older man and and not interested in, in hitting on the girls, you know. Uh, not you know he's he, he, he he's not got anything to prove he's not trying to take any money he's like a sated lion making money so easy here in the 21st century he doesn't have to you know time people in this entertainment you know um, and so he's like a, a sated lion he doesn't really need anything he's way overqualified just to survive you know in the 21st century so he's you know having fun with the kids playing with them you know and uh, uh, 
screwing with pulling it. I got your nose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pull my finger. <laughs> but what's nice about that, what's freedom loving of that is, is that everybody likes to play with granddaddy. Even old ladies and old men. <laughs> they, do, <laughs> like, they, they become like kids again sometimes playing with Pop. Mm-hmm. You know, because Pop isn't afraid to treat them like they were a little kid. Not afraid to get up in their face and make a silly face. Mm-hmm. You know, it, he's like granddaddy. Plus, he's not he, he's not a threat, you know, to right. people. Right. So I get a lot more, if I'm doing walk around, I get a lot more people taking up, you know, uh, because of the outfit and the uh, presentation, you know, that uh, I get a lot more yeses than I used to before I was pop. Mm-hmm. And you just mentioned the the trickster. Um, you have a lot of layers to your character, and you've talked about that before. But it, I I personally love the trickster. Um, do you have any routines where you feel like the trickster really shines? Well, the shell game, of course, is the of ultimate course. you know <laughs> fixer. You know, mm-hmm. um, because usually the trickster hides him. He he hides his cleverness behind magic. You know, oh, it's a tell. A teleportation device. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, he, he he has a story that explains it. You know, mm-hmm. with a magical story. Well, the the magic. You see, the two characters. Audiences, if you're not a charlatan, um, and you're there just for entertainment, the audience will recognize who you are. You're you're a magician. That's a character all, all in itself that they've heard about since they were little kids. They they met magicians at you know birthday parties when they were kids. They saw magicians on TV. They've read about magicians in the fantasy books. They have all kinds of ideas of who this magic character is. He's a trickster. What he does isn't real, but it sure looks real, and nobody knows how he does it. That's what a that's what a magician's character is in our society, and so he can be played with. Um, you don't have to present a character. You don't have to be a character. You are a character. The audience will add stuff to you. For example, if you just did the coin in the bottle, and you said, here, look at this coin, look at this bottle, hold the bottle like this, bam, the coin's inside. (laughs) Examine it, bam, it's outside. You don't have to build a character. You don't have to tell them a lie about magic. Um, They will fill all that in Mm -hmm. when they think about it. They go, oh, my God, what happened? How did... How could that possibly solid through solid? Well, remember Superman, he could vibrate at a certain speed and pass through walls. You know, they start thinking about all the, all the fantasy things that, that might appeal, uh, apply. Mm-hmm. And who is this guy? Why is he doing this? They have to make that up, and they, they, you know, they'll create a, a magician character. Well, so that's, that's why you don't really need to play a character. The audience, when you start doing magic, they know what the bit is. You know, there's a guy who's going to show us something impossible. And it's not really something impossible. It just looks like that. You know, so you ask the guy about the bottle, uh, you know, he said, well, I saw a magician. What, what did he do? He put a coin in a bottle. Bullshit. Oh, no, it's <laughs> true. I actually saw him do it. Well, it must have been a trick bottle. No, I drank beer out of that bottle. It was my bottle. I gave it to him. Well, it was a trick coin then. Well, I examined the coin. It was just a normal half dollar. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe he switched coins. Maybe he did, but I was holding the bottle by the neck. The coin went in through the bottom of the bottle. What kind of trick coin can go through the bottom of a bottle? (laughs) Well, you think it was real magic? No, but you tell me what was it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's the way the magic story should go. The guy telling the story should be able to defend it. You know, now uh, he, he should be able. If somebody questions him, like <laughs> I mean, if you saw a strong man at the circus and and he'd been a, a steel bar around his neck, you know, and you went and told somebody about it, and they said, "Well, was it a real steel bar? Or could it have been lead or something?" I don't know. Nobody looked at it. <laughs> That's a stupid story. Mm-hmm. You won't ever tell it again either. Right. Magic shows the same way. You didn't. You didn't check the bottle. <laughs> you, <laughs> if you, I saw a girl just floating on the sidewalk today as I was going to work. Well, are you sure she was floating? Well, yeah, I saw her. She was floating. Well, did you look underneath? No. Did you check behind her to see if there was a pole or something? She could, no. What? What kind of story is that? <laughs> 
So when we tell the magic story, we want them to be able to defend it. We have to give them the tools they need to tell the story and to defend it. Oh, it couldn't have been a force. I had a chance to change my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, because if somebody can take the story away from them, then it's not such a good story. They won't ever tell it again. If they can't take it away from them, they'll start lying to make it even better. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And like you said, they have the choice to change their mind. That happens in your your Chicago um, surprise, surprise, right? Yeah. Well, that's sort of how this whole thing came about. I used to do the Chicago opener. And there was a killer trick, and people loved it until some guy came back to me one day and said, I know how you did that trick you did for me the other night. I said, how's that? He says, you forced a card on me. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I have a friend that does magic, and he said, the only way you could have done that is if you had made me take that second card. Mm-hmm. And, oh, well, that's a good explanation. You know, just mumbled it. And, yeah. you know, but I, it was like that guy had had his great story of that trick taken away from him by somebody who... Um, suggested it might be a force. So I realized, well, I've got to help them defend that story. I have to come up with a way that they can, somebody says it's a force, they can say, no, it couldn't have been a force, and here's why. Then they've got a story they can tell and defend, and that's where the Chicago surprise came into being. But it's the whole attitude to me is where I discovered that really the, the magic story is not a story we tell to them, but it's a story we enact that um, they're a participant in and that they tell later. So what we're doing really is trying to help them remember a fake experience, to remember the magic the way we want them to remember it, so that it's got all the proofs and even more than, you know, actually it did. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, if you can get them... Uh, to buy the impossibility of the coin and bottle. That's great. But now, see, you're letting them have all... Um, they, they, they describe who the magic character is. They have to fantasize how it could have been done um, you, or by what processes the magic could have worked if it was real magic. Um, but, you know, the, the, to me, the artist should take more of that on himself. You know, it's like when you have a choice to influence their fantasy and tell them who the character is and why he's doing it, then why wouldn't you? You know, to me, the artist takes charge of the whole package, so he gives them the experience, the exact experience he wants. He doesn't let them make up what it could have been, you know, that he's from another planet. No, he, he tells them, you know, he's from the past or whatever he is. And Does that make sense? No, I, I, it com- yeah, no, it completely makes sense. I, I, the reason for the character then is because I wanted to take charge of the fantasy. I wanted to give them an experience as, as concrete as if they had met Doctor Who and he had tried to prove to them who he was, you know. Right, and just um, I'm, I just want to take a minute here and just compliment you real quick. I love your Chicago surprise. I love... Um, your linking rings, your shell game. I've, I've watched your penguin lecture countless times. And you mentioned earlier, it was you. You want magic that like twelve year olds and adults can enjoy. I found you when I was about eleven, and you've been one of my favorite magicians since. And you're also the only magician that my mom likes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get. I actually, I hear a lot of, of people that hate magic like pop. I <laughs> guess it's because it's it's more committed. And should have been committed. <laughs> it's it's so uh, crazy and 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 weird, you know that the uh, people it, it, it's it's a new experience. It's, they like it. It's different. Mm-hmm. You know, it's as if what would it be like if you met a guy from the 19th century, right. you know, <laughs> uh, who was a, a trained con man, you know. It's a, it's an interesting thing if you if you had a chance to talk to Doc Holliday, have a beer with him, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, that's kind of what I think the magic experience is like. It's not that you be told a story, not that you get a whole story, but that you believe the character has a story. Mm-hmm. They brought him to here and took him further out. It's as if on a stage, when you roll a bowling ball off the stage and then the sound effects take up, and you hear it keep on rolling farther and farther until it rolls down the steps and hits the car and the car alarm goes off. Well, in your imagination, you've extended that stage mm-hmm. way out into the parking lot. Mm-hmm. You know, 
it's not real, and you know it's not real, but it's made a bigger memory picture in your head, you know. And in the same way, we extend our character into the past and future, make people feel like they're they're part of a continuing story, and prick their interest rather than. Uh, it's it's not so much that they they need to know what the story is; they need to feel like there is one. Right. Every magic show to me is kind of like the Twilight Zone. Ladies and gentlemen, your next performer will be so-and-so the magician. And the magician walks out and he takes out a deck of cards and offers the lady at the table uh, to pick a card. And that's when Rod Serling steps out. And little did they know that what they thought was a typical experience of a magic show would be... <laughs> you know, and That's the way every magic show kind of should be written. Who is this guy and why is he different? Why is he not like every other magician you've seen? You know, um, well, because he has a story and there's something about it that's interesting. And he seems like he's not just some kid. I think when magicians do stories about magic, I think they often make the mistake of doing a story about the little kid that became a magician. Their own story, the story of the real person. Nobody gives a shit about that person. <laughs> they want to hear how, uh, how Wog became Merlin. <laughs> they want to hear the backstory of your magical character. Yeah. And that's what Vernon was saying. Don't tell him it takes a lot of work. It's a knack. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you want him to go, wow, well, what kind of knack could that be? You know, <laughs> the idea that we take you know, years and years and years of preparation just to fool them with this one trick, people can't really absorb that. It's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They don't believe anybody would put that much time and work into just fooling them on a silly little magic trick. So, so I guess Vernon, uh, that was the real secret we want to hide. Yeah. There's no work at all. It's just <laughs> a knack. Mm -hmm. The but magic guess, it has to have a lie at its heart to oh, be definitely. charming. Definitely, and in a way, it kind of is a knack because only only an insane person would spend so much time dedicating hours of practice into something that, <laughs> if done right, shouldn't be seen. Well, it's a peculiar little mix of obsessive compulsiveness and attention deficit disorder and narcissism, you know, and autism. <laughs> There's a certain spectrum of that that, that makes you a magician. Mm -hmm. Slightly mix the mix is slightly off. You probably end up um, a computer programmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you have some of just the best routines. Um, like your linking ring routine is one of the only ones that I'm like, oh, that's a unique linking ring routine. How how do you create your routines? Like right. that? Theft. <laughs> well, no, really, it was. Um, the two routines that I learned when I was a kid was Di Vernon's uh, six ring routine and the Jack Miller five ring routine. And uh, when I started working the street. Um, I, and I was doing the rings. People would want to see the rings right after the show. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll just drop the key ring in the case or something when I'm putting them away and hand them to them and let them examine the rest of them. And I, that didn't work because people always go, well, is there any more of these? They, they didn't know how many rings you had. Mm -hmm. When you're doing six rings, it's, to them, it's just a bunch of rings. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll just do four ring routine. That way uh, I can drop the key ring and pick up another single. And I'd have a chain of two and two single rings I could use and do a, the Weber emergency routine with that. And so when I started doing that, at first I just used a, a section from the Jack Miller routine with those four, with, uh, with the, the key ring and the single and the chain of two. And I kind of developed that routine along that line just so people could examine the rings at the end. I could put them away and switch the key ring in the action, leave them halfway out of the bag. And since people knew there were four, I could pick them all up and show them. And at one point, some guy in the audience, I, was, I had his back turned to him, and my rings came apart, and I put them back together and turned around, and he held his up like he had done the same thing. The audience just, just went into hysterics. And I just thought, well, that's, that's the thing I need to work on. I have to find a way to make them do that every time. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the routine gradually developed. So basically, and I, I combined some of the moves from Di Vernon's routine with uh, the moves from uh, uh, Jack Miller's routine. I added maybe a couple of moves of my own. 
but that was it, and most of it was all stolen from the uh, other magicians and from the audience. <laughs> but the thing is, if you steal enough from different people and stuff, it's like putting a new coat of paint on it. And the owner won't even recognize it. The art artistic way of stealing is to cover your sources, you know, put a new coat of paint on the stolen car. <laughs> if, the, if the owner doesn't recognize you have stolen from him, then you've done it right. But it it all also goes with your story. Like you do um, you do the silk to egg, but you do it in a way that perfectly fits you. Right. So yeah, I I think that's awesome. Well, thank you. But it's also that those routines would fit anybody with it, mostly the same words. Mm -hmm. It's like Hamlet. You know, magicians forget that you know a good routine is hard to come by. Right. And Vernon said a lot of uh, the only. Uh, art in the world is magic that would allow a beginner to paint over a masterpiece. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's what we do, and we encourage it. We encourage people to be original before they've even learned the art. We have contests for 14-year-olds that a big chunk is based on originality. And I think mm -hmm. that at that age, they should be learning magic, learning the routines and doing the copying they need to do to uh, understand the way magic's supposed to work and how to uh, cover works I, I've stolen so much from every magician I've ever seen you know um, but it's, it's things like the important things like I, I told Johnny Thompson once I stole from him he, he got all p pissy <laughs> he said what what and I said well you know sometimes you uh, somebody says something in the audience and you crack up and lose your character and he goes yeah and I said why do you do that he said well because People aren't real comfortable laughing at Tom Sony until they know it's just an act. If they think he might really be this old man, annoying old man, you know, uh, arrogant old man, they'd feel sorry for him and, and not laugh at him. So as soon as you break character, they go, oh, it's okay to laugh. He's okay. He's, he's <laughs> the guy behind there. And I said, I did the same thing with my Whit Hayden character. I would, you know, be a substitute teacher, you know, having a hard time, and somebody say something, I laugh and and lose the character for a second, and that let them know that the character wasn't real, that I was just playing. So that's something I stole from Johnny. He said, "Well, that was a good thing to steal." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> And, but yeah, you still, I mean, because when you take something just by watching them, you learn stuff by watching them, the way they look, the way they move, the way they, and I, I learned most, so much from um, Eddie Factor and his constant engagement with the audience, asking questions, pushing them, teasing them, talking to them, you know, um, kept them on their toes and they felt like they had an experience, you know. Um he was. I just posted some video of him up on my YouTube uh, channel. It's a, a wonderful uh, taken just before his death uh, of him doing a whole show, a close-up act. It was great. I recommend people checking that out. Eddie Fector. All right. Yeah. Go do that. Go check it out if you're listening. Go right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Wait till you finish listening to yes, this. Yes. Wait. wait. <laughs> Well, I just I just want to ask you uh, one more thing. You've been right. um, you, and thank you so much again for coming on. Um, you well, have, I've enjoyed it. It's fun. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm glad you've enjoyed it. But you you have been doing your linking rings for a while. You've been doing the shell game. Do you ever do you ever get bored and want to do new things, or do you just do you love the acts that you do so much that you just you want to keep doing them genuinely? Oh, I I I always want to keep doing this, the oldest stuff I've got. You know. It's, uh, part of the reason for the character, uh, to become an old man character, to become a character from the 19th century, was the, it kind of gives me an excuse to do a lot of magic that um, is hard to justify the hands of a guy in a modern three-piece suit. You know, why would you have a piece of rope? Why would you have a silk scarf? Right. You know, these are not 21st century things. But uh, an old character like Pop can get away with doing the linking rings and all those <laughs> other things and can kind of justify them. And like newspaper tear, I love to do the newspaper tear, but soon there won't be any newspapers available. I'll have to have my own printed. You know? 
Yeah. And but because it's pop, he could. I brought this from <laughs> 1910. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, so he kind of can justify doing all this, the classics of magic that I want to do, the billiard balls and all the other things. So I actually, I've always expanded the character to do so I I could do every piece of magic I wanted. I didn't. Uh, a lot a lot of times people think of a character like I'm going to be a gambler which means I can only do card tricks, and I can only do card tricks that have to do with sleight of hand and cheating at cards. I go, well, why do you stop there? Why wouldn't a gambler do magic tricks? It was a very popular form of entertainment for the uh, men and ladies back in that period. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know that Erdnays was a gambler and a magician. Mm-hmm. And um, Wyatt Earp knew how to do the shell game, and Soapy Smith did magic tricks. You know, so uh, I would I would think it would be perfectly reasonable for uh, uh, gambling to, to have uh, also magic ability. All you have to do is change the story a little bit. Who is this guy? And why would he be doing magic? So it's the same thing with magic. To me, I I think you should choose the magic you want to do, and then pick the character or change the character to suit the magic. The character is there to serve the magic. It's not the main thing. In acting, it's the main thing, but in, in magic, the main thing is creating this experience of the impossible. Mm-hmm. You know, and so um, in in this experience, the, the character um, is everything. But uh, the character is not everything. It's just there to serve. The, in this kind of experience, the character is, is, is not there except to improve the magic, to, to make it more interesting or make it more palatable. Um, uh, so, if I want to do a magic, for example, I wanted to do the teleportation device, which was something that I've been doing since 1980. Mm-hmm. Well, for a con man from the 19th century to do something like that, um, he'd have to uh, be into Tesla and you know uh, all that kind of stuff. And so, I had to change Pop and to add to the story that he was interested in science and technology and you know so forth. And then I could create a, a version of the teleportation device that was 19th century looking and then Pop could do it. Mm-hmm. So I just changed the character whenever I needed to when I wanted to do a magic trick that Pop couldn't do. If it didn't fit <laughs> Pop, I would change the character, the story of the Pop, so it would make sense. Awesome. <laughs> well, and the story is very detailed. It's, it goes right. from 1849 all the way to 1910 and uh, it has his, Pop's complete history and you know some of his experiences. Eventually, I'd love to do dime novels about Pop in the 19th century. Oh, you know, would, his adventures in the 19th century. <laughs> yeah. So, and also, you know, when you think about it, on the, the reason for Pop is because on the Internet, it's very difficult to have enough material mm-hmm. to keep something going forever. You know, it's like, how many magic tricks are there? <laughs> You want as many different kind of things you can do to add to your character and backstory as possible. So I have experiments with magnetized water, pitches for um, you know teleportation device, and uh, I, political speeches when I run for office. Um, I want as many story items as I can have um, on the internet so that people have a lot to go through. They shouldn't be able to exhaust. Uh, pop on the internet um, just in an hour or two. They should should be enough to keep them going for days, if possible. So you and uh, every magician is we're going to create. It's going to be more important how we appear on the internet than anywhere else. I have because of the internet. I have fans in Malaysia and uh, Russia and um, Norway. Um, you know that otherwise would never have seen me. Mm-hmm. But now I have a, a wide uh, exposure. A lot. I put up a lot of video, and plus I have stories. And um, you know uh, things that are related, you know, uh, like the uh, magnetized water and other things that I sell. It all becomes a, a part of it, and it gives me a lot more stuff to publish. For sure. Thank, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. Um, is there anything, any last thing you'd like to say to anyone who's still listening? Um. Well, good luck. <laughs> magic is a lot of fun it's a fun way to make a living it's a hard way to make a living but it's fun and I've always I'm, I'm 69 years old uh, this month and still having a ball I'm still having fun doing magic awesome well happy birthday thank you